So welcome to another episode of Crap No One Tells You. With me today <laughs> is a good friend of mine, Christopher Nelson from 1847 Financial. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, Chris. Thank you. And we are going to be talking about some of the crap no one tells you about financial management or money management. So let me just start flat out. What is some crap no one tells you about <laughs> managing your money? <laughs> uh, that things change all the time. That there are so many tools out there that you can be using and that there are tools that change. And depending on what happens in the economy, depending on what happens in the world, your financial plan can go 180 degrees. And what I see, I just see people doing the same thing over and over again that used to be important from, you know, they may have learned it from their parents. They may 20 have years ago, from, 30 yeah, years correct, ago. Right. Correct. And those tools have changed. Um, you know, good examples of this, you know, a year, two years ago, there was a lot of leverage from home equity lines of credit. Well, money was cheap. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, like, yeah. So you would, you would leverage money. You would mm -hmm. use dollars for different things. But now you're trying to find new ways to get at them, new ways to get at your money, access to your finances, ways to pay yourself versus paying somebody else for that same dollar. And what I see is that people have preconceived notions based on old history, knowledge of a product, mm -hmm. information on Google, <laughs> things that are out there that they right. see or hear. They heard it from their dad. They heard it from their mom. I want a dividend producing stock. I want, you know, uh, an annuity is bad at all times. Life insurance is bad. Investments are bad. Money markets but, are bad. But it's, it's, I mean, realistically, if we would sit 100 people down today mm -hmm. and start asking them basic financial questions, how aware do you think people in general are that money can be... Because you and I can sit and have a conversation about, you know, oh, here's how you leverage your money, mm -hmm. right? Most people don't even understand what leveraging your money is. And that's a very valid point, that it has to start sooner. Um, just simple finance, uh, how to pay down debt, uh, how to be efficient. There is such things as having good debt. Um, I, I have seen for years clients pay off mortgages, pay off mortgages early, pay money down on mortgages. These are 2%, 3% mortgages. Today, you can get a 5% CD. Right. And somebody paid down a mortgage at 10 years at 2.5% for their, just to get rid of their mortgage. Now, but 2.5% interest is really nothing. You Correct. could be, That's, that money... So let me simplify for those that don't understand what you're really saying. So rather than paying off a loan that carries a 2.5% interest, you could take that same money, leverage it, put it into an investment that makes you more than what the 2.5% is costing you. Correct. It's just being efficient. There is also a part of this, though, that can't go un undiscussed or, or that we should definitely go over, which is you have to be able to sleep at night. That's... You know, the financial book may say one thing, <laughs> right? but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's always going to be in the client's best interest per Correct. se. So when I bring this up, I'm talking from a financial viewpoint. I'm not saying that paying off a mortgage isn't the appropriate action if somebody wants to Correct. If it get makes rid you, of that. If yes. it makes you sleep better at night, then Correct. absolutely prioritize yes. it, right? And, and for instance, <clears throat> there are so many times I've worked with clients where we've been very efficient with how they're doing their debt or, or paying down their debt or maybe eliminating their debt only to reaccumulate debt, which is not an appropriate action for somebody as well. <laughs> I don't want to take a credit card, pay it off with a line of credit or a mm -hmm. refinance of any capacity just to have them put $20,000 back on the credit, credit card. card. Right. They're just going to be in the same boat down well, the line. Uh, worse boat because now you have <laughs> correct now, <laughs> now you, you have, have two, a, two forms correct now correct. you have a line of credit and a credit card yeah so sometimes it's just about getting so the right tools one of the things that I see frequently um, is people have a tendency of accumulating credit card debt right and I also want to talk to you about student loans okay um, but people have a tendency of accumulating credit cards especially people that barely make ends meet, right? It's easy. You need a new tire, you go swipe a credit card, right? Most people then don't have a plan for how to get rid of that credit card debt because mm -hmm. credit cards, borrowing money from the credit card company is not cheap, Correct. right? Like it's, 
if you're in that situation, you probably have what a 22, 24% interest rate, mm -hmm. which means that money is costing you an extra 25% every year that it sits on your card, mm -hmm. right? So for simple math, if you put $400 in your credit card in a year, that would be 500, mm -hmm. right? What, what is the best course of action or how would someone go about f even figuring out how to start paying off credit card debt? Look for efficient methods of utilizing the same dollars, but doing it in a more efficient way. For instance, that is where the leverage of a home equity line of credit, maybe a loan on your 401k if you have the assets inside of a retirement vehicle like a 401k, where you could borrow that and be paying yourself the interest or at a lower interest. Um, part of being good, sound financial planning is you still have to live within your means. There's still only so many things you can do. Um, and a lot of, I see some clients will utilize debit instead of credit to limit that. That's a tough one when it comes to debit because then you're putting yourself in a position where you have to have those funds and maybe there are some needs or necessities. So coming up and creating the personal budget that you need, the personal plan that you need, coming up with better ways to do it or ways to leverage your assets. A so, lot of times, just having the doors open to you and not utilizing them is beneficial. Okay. So it's not, I mean, it's not a one size fits all. It's, Correct. But, you know, it's, it's understanding that not all debt is bad either, right? Correct. So it's, you have to understand when, when is it appropriate to use your debt or your credit mm -hmm. in order to help either dig yourself out of a hole or to get ahead, right? Correct. So I would say one of the things I always bring up and talk to clients about is that there's always an ability to get a loan. Someone will always give you money to borrow for everything in life other than retirement. They'll <laughs> let you start a business. <laughs> right. They will but let you buy a car. Mm -hmm. They will let you buy a house, but they won't lend you money to retire. So getting multiple uses out of every dollar that you're saving is important. I see a lot where they'll keep money in cash, which is very important. You want to have leverage, you want to have cash in, in play, but utilizing that and getting safe types of returns is okay. Is, is with, with the digital world we're in, mm -hmm. is having cash on hand really that important anymore? Because like you can pull money from anywhere, any place within like 48 hours. Right? Correct. But it is still important to have it there, one, for peace of mind, and two, to also have that flexibility because sometimes investments and other things will create tax issues if mm. you pull from those locations, timing issues. For instance, you don't want to have an investment account where you don't have any control that today the market was down 3%, tomorrow it's back up, but you needed that money today. Right. So you want to have those CDs. CDs are great. They, they allow you to get a higher interest rate on those those cash dollars, but if you pull from them too early, then they just eliminate. So you might as well have had it in cash anyway. So those yeah. are the, the problem is timing and that's where the cash comes into, into play. Okay. So really it's, it's understanding how all of these different things work. Like what's the upside? What's the downside? Always know both. Always uh, know both. Upside and downside. Yes. Cause I mean, almost every investment out there has both, right? Correct. Like there's no investment that's just an upside. Correct. And there's none that are just a downside. Right. There's always going to be a purpose for that tool in your overall plan. Okay. So let's get back to student loans. <laughs> always a good um, one. Because I just had a conversation with someone um, probably last week. And we were talking about how when kids, and I'm going to call them kids, Mm -hmm. even though that just shows how old I'm getting. <laughs> um, when they are filling out the financial information, mm -hmm. right? And they're going through Faster. their... Yep. yep. And one of the things that shocked me was he said, you know, there is no guidance going through this. And literally with two checkboxes, you can go, oh, I want to borrow money for, um, you know what do they call that? Like food and boarding. And mm -hmm. um, I want to borrow money for a new computer. Um, mm -hmm. And I also want to make interest only payments. Mm -hmm. And they're literally just check boxes. Mm -hmm. No explanations, what it is, what it does. And then um, people don't realize that when they're done, 
and you're only paying the interest um, and you get out of college and you now have $100,000 worth of debt mm -hmm. and you're making interest only payments. Um, let me just put it this way. I understand why people freak out when they finally have to start making payments on that because that's like having a mortgage. It is a mortgage. <laughs> it it is becomes a mortgage. a mortgage. Right. Yes. So how does someone that is going off to college and because I will put money on that most people have no idea how this stuff works, mm -hmm. right? Like people don't generally understand compounding interest in either direction, yep. whether it's on money you have or money you owe. Yep. When an 18 year old goes to fill out and it's three check boxes and those three check boxes can add $75,000 or $50,000 to what you owe after four years, paying interest on it for four years, accruing interest, right? Mm -hmm. um, what should an 18 year old do to understand what they are really about to get in themselves into? So one is just purely getting some education, some background. There's starting to become some nonprofit organizations out there that are helping with FAFSA forms and other uh, lending options out there. Um, I've seen some of the interest rates come down even on student loans, um, but it is about looking for those types of options that are out there. And you can go, you know, schooling is a hard one. You don't want to change up your, your major or your idea, but you may not know what you want. So some students are starting out on, you know, going to community colleges just mm -hmm. to get their gen eds and, and do it at, a, at an inexpensive cost. Others have some plans in place. I think it all starts a little earlier than 18, unfortunately. If you're starting at 18, you're probably behind the eight ball. Right. It is what it is at that point. You're just taking on, you just got to find the most efficient way to do it. And what we try to help clients out with as parents, as their kids are growing, as their children are, are growing in those, is just to get them financial literacy. Just what is a good dollar going to be used for? What is good debt? What is bad debt? And then helping guide with there's always another location. And again, it comes back to shop around. Do, does a student, uh, is, is a student offered credit card or something along those lines cheaper or more expensive than getting a student loan from say a bank or from, fan, uh, from any of the governmental organizations that are out there? We try to help clients save for multiple uses. So for instance, Roth IRAs, putting in and putting into, say, a Roth for a parent or for a child that might be working, that can be used for education. Um, doing things like cash value life insurance is another one that I utilize because it's not registered on FAFSA forms as an opportunity, so I build up equity that I can use for either college and or retirement later on in life. You can save to 529 plans. They have one use and one use only. That's the college one, That's right? the college plans, yep. They have one use and one use only. And part of the problem with 529 plans is it's very limited on the amount of time you're investing and in getting that growth, and it has to be used for college. You can pass them on to others. You can now, the government has just recently said you can turn them into Roth IRAs after the fact. Okay. So there are some strategies that they're trying to make them a little bit better, but it has one use and one use only. They were pretty well... If if you weren't 100% positive your kid was going to going college, to college yeah. it was useless. And it's really good for family members to be putting away that want to say, you know what, mm -hmm. education is really important, so I want it to be used for education. That's fine. It's great for that. On the parent front, you can do other things where what if cash flow is there for the parents or takes care of something? Right. My dad did something special for me. So, so what you're saying is, sorry to interrupt you, but like, so these kids that are signing off on their life to go to college yep. at 17, 18, because they don't understand it is what we're really saying is we as parents need to understand this way before that point in time so that we can explain this to the kids. Yes. It has to be part of it. I wish it was in schools. I wish it was in high <laughs> yeah. schools. I think simple understanding here's, of finance. Here's is, algebra. No, no, no. Here's how to balance a checkbook. <laughs> yes. And, and here's where you put your money or here's how a retirement plan works. You know, pensions are gone. It, it just doesn't exist. We've changed life around. Now they mm -hmm. need to know how to save. And that's not something we're, we're teaching. Now, there's also a lot of money floating around in the older generations that's going to be passed on, but probably not in a college timeline. And you're just trying to find the efficient way to pay that debt. And it may be 
getting student so, loans. So are student loans overall good? They can be used properly, yes. They're not bad. Okay. It's, it relatively, it's it, relatively cheap money, right? Correct. It's still relatively cheap. It was actually more than those other tools until recently. So okay. again, that's why I say tools change and investments change because three years ago, no, a student loan was actually more than a home equity line of credit or, lo or loan. So it's, it's always one of those tricky questions, right? Is at what point do you need to talk to a financial advisor, mm -hmm. right? And at what point does a financial advisor actually want to talk to you? Because I have a feeling a lot of people that need financial advisors the most are the ones that have the least to work with. I would agree with you there. And that's part of the, the, the issue. The way the compensation and things work in our profession, in our field, is that it's all about assets under management. It's all about what are you doing and where are you saving. I think that needs to change. And it has changed. Some advisors charge fees to just talk with you. But I think it so becomes more of like an education, more of an type. educational okay. facility. But they might charge a consultation fee or right. or a annual fee to work with them. My doctor doesn't see me for free. Yeah, and that's where it kind of <laughs> comes from, and that's where it all generates. Um, but there's still a disconnect there in the industry. So I think it has to come back on the the parents of the children to start to have these conversations and know they may or may not be looking at retirement yet but maybe they are worried about college planning. I sat down with a client last night, four girls, 117. That's their biggest topic. That's what they want to know and, and do. They have some assets, they have some things they're putting away, but again, we're just working through some different strategies on where is the best, most efficient way to do it. Cash flow, taking a loan, helping the child pay that loan might be the answer until they're in a working position. So you're deferring down the line but you're, you're still helping and you can still get that education. It comes right. quick. So, and, and another thing that I notice a lot, especially, you know, I mean, you and I probably talk money more than most, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, you do it for a living and I just understand more than I ever wanted to. Um, but what I'm starting to realize is that there's good advice and then there's good advice for you, mm -hmm. right? And those two are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -mm. Right, because, um, like back to the, I was looking at someone I know was um, accumulating credit card debt, and I told them flat out, um, go get a zero percent balance transfer credit card. While before this kills your credit score, yep. get a zero percent APR for eight months or twelve months, however long you can get it, and then consolidate all your credit cards onto that mm -hmm. because you will no longer be paying interest on that. Yes, you're paying the 3% transfer fee, but the 3% transfer fee... Small in comparison. Uh, <laughs> right, yes. compared to 19% interest, whatever it is every year. And there was no way they were paying this off in months, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we knew we were looking at a number that would be sitting there for at least a year, mm -hmm. right? So having to explain to someone, yes, you have $10,000 worth of credit card debt. No, you're not paying it off immediately. In 12 months, that's going to be you know, $12,000, mm -hmm. right? And same thing with um, the student loans, right? I was talking to someone, call it seven years ago, owed $28,000 in student loans. Um, had something come up, lost their job, couldn't make payments on their student loans, didn't call them to get anything frozen. Mm -hmm. I just ran into this person last year um, because of, losing track of that and it going into collections, his student loan debt is now 63000 So over seven years, it tripled. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is, are there things or are there tools in place to help people that are in those types of situations or are you just unilaterally screwed? Yeah, <laughs> and that's a very difficult conversation and a very difficult question to answer because the truth is is that there has to be some onus on the individual themselves. Correct. Um, you know, we, we can't, you know, turn water into wine. It's <laughs> just, you know, it's got to be part of what you're doing. You have to be, and that's why I talk about efficiencies. You have to find the tools that you can then keep putting the same amount of month, monthly money down that you can manage, and you have to get tight in other areas. Inflation hurts that. Other things make that very difficult, but we have to make it a priority 
or you'll constantly be in that that cycle and no financial advisor is actually going to be able to assist. They're going to be able to give you guide. They're going to be able to give you tools, but it's got to be your ownness that takes over there. And that's why I say starting a little bit earlier, that's why we have to probably be making some changes in our schooling and right. the way we educate our, our students. But the parents have to take the onus too to educate themselves on what they can be doing. And there are other avenues. Some parents say, I had to pay my student debt. My student has to do theirs. They have to learn from that. Um, and that's where it comes from. And others will choose that they want to own that. And that's okay too. The, the thing is, is that as an advisor, we're here to help and we are here to guide, but there is something that has to fall onto each person. Um, I can't do my job without all of a personal, personal information from a client. If they're right. not really ready to get it together, they don't, I can't, they I, don't tell you everything. Not, yeah, right. it, it's being pushed to the back burner and that's where it's going to remain. And they will be probably in a, in a downward spiral from time to time. But if they own it, if they try to make it a priority, the clients I met with yesterday, they've been clients for 14 years. That's how long I've worked with them. Okay. Um, they were working on credit card debt for almost 10 of that. Now they're out. Now they're in a better position. They've saved. Now there are things we can be doing. So even 14 years ago, I helped them with those those things with that guidance, but today they're now able to right. utilize those do, tools. Do, do you think people, so this is kind of like off the wall question, mm -hmm. um, you know, when people do weight loss, mm -hmm. right? Someone goes on a diet and they think they're going to lose 30 pounds in a month, yep. right? Whatever it is, it, people are always unrealistic. And you sit down and you look at them and go, listen, it took you 30 years to get to this point. So what if it takes five years to get back? Yep. Is that kind of the same mindset people have to adapt when they get in over their head Slow into debt? Slow and steady, yes, is that certainly. The getting out is not a one-year plan, it's nope. a five-year plan. Correct. And yes, it's going to cost you a ton because you don't have access to other capital, but you have to treat it like a long-term. If, if you have $40,000 in debt and you've never saved more than $10,000 a year, how are you going to get out within one year? <laughs> right. It has to just be, you just have to chip away at it and do things that are appropriate. I cannot harp enough on the utilizing multiple strategies, getting multiple uses out of a single dollar, put it where it can be used to pay off your debt at a later time to that mortgage conversation. Even if right. you put that money away into your so, and bank account, you can write them the check to the right. mortgage company. But you have to make sure that whatever money you are utilizing or where you're putting it is still generating more than what you're losing on the other side. Correct. Don't put it in your so like, checking account and <laughs> and not pay off your mortgage that's 3.5% because right. it's low and you just want to hold on to cash. Uh, and same thing. Don't don't start by paying off your low interest debt. Start with your high interest, high interest debt. debt. I'm, I'm more surprised how many times I see credit card debt and cash in, in a checking account. Really? I see it all the time. People with thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars of, of rolling some form credit cards of debt, <laughs> right? Or, or rolling credit cards, and forty, fifty thousand dollars sitting in their savings account. Yep, I see it. Okay, I do see <laughs> yeah, it. Sorry, I, I don't even know um, where to. <laughs> or, or they have credit card debt. Here's a good one that I do see a lot too. They have credit card debt or high interest debt, mm -hmm. and they keep trying to max out their four hundred one k. You know sometimes not getting the company match might still be more beneficial than and paying down debt than putting into the 401k. It's all person by person specific. And that's one of the problems with finance 101. We're teaching everybody as a whole, pay down right. debt or do other things. Correct. But at the same time, really what we're saying is they have to learn from themselves. Right. So we have to, each person's situation is different. And one recommendation should not be used on multiple people. So are there resources out there for people that aren't comfortable talking to a financial advisor yet that want to learn more? Like, what do you do? I mean, seminars, um, okay. usually larger corporations will offer seminars. You could look in and see if there's seminars and training. A lot of financial advisors will do seminars to drum up and, and create uh, relationships at times too. So it might be, behoove you to go online, check and see what's at your local networking event or mm -hmm. other things where they might be putting on a seminar. I don't personally do too many of those right. or do them um, just personally, but I do know advisors that do offer them that do talk about specific topics. Yeah. So um, 
someone we know actually does this for the the mortgage industry, yep. right? Like they they show first time home buyers mm-hmm. how to become first time home buyers. Yep. Right. That that whole myth, and this is what we had someone on the podcast too. We were talking about the whole myth of twenty percent down. Right. And it's another one of those examples is people don't understand the financial tools that are available to leverage um, because they have changed since your grandparents bought their house. Right. Like financial times have changed. Mm -hmm. Inflation has changed. Price of stuff has changed. Right. Mortgage rates have changed. Correct. (laughs) So like utilizing advice from 20 years ago, hell, even utilizing advice from what, five years ago. Yeah. Because I remember you and I were on the golf course. And we were having a conversation about a specific stock. Mm-hmm. And I remember it. Oh, you remember it? Yeah. <laughs> right. And you were like, eh. and I'm like, I'm going to buy more. Yeah. I'm getting in. <laughs> I'm getting in. Mm-hmm. I'm all in. Right. <laughs> and then that stock, what, like quadrupled over, mm-hmm. over the following six months. Mm-hmm. Now that's. It's back down. <laughs> it's back down. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's one of those where like that's like hitting a gold mine. Like that doesn't happen in general. Yeah, people um and I see this with people that do their own investing. Mm-hmm. Um one of the things is like, yeah, I I tried doing this investing thing and like I would buy something and then it would drop 10% and I would try to get out and buy something else. And I'm like, so you weren't really trying to invest. Mm-hmm. You were trying to trade. You were trying to time. Right. Yes. Which, good luck. Yeah. Got to be right twice. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. Getting so, in and getting out. So unless you are doing that 100% for a living, mm-hmm. um, I don't think, I, and I think part of the problem is we see this glorified all over social media, right? Correct. Like traders and, oh, I made $10,000 in a day. The winning stories. Correct, right? Yeah. You don't see the fact that they may have lost a hundred grand this year on top Mm -hmm. of it. So the day they made 10,000, they share it. They don't share it the day before when they lost 15. I still remember the three specific client stories that I have that actually did win and hit it. (laughs) Right. I'll never forget that. Right. Like, and even though, even them mm want to get out and diversify, but then tax becomes a question. Correct. Other issues come up when you try to get out. So they have to monitor and manage it and, that's difficult too. And it's, I think part of managing your money is being able to see long-term, right? My very first stock purchase about, I don't know, eight years ago, whatever it was, was General Electric. How Mm -hmm. could General Electric do anything wrong, right? Mm -hmm. We had a president that said, oh no, that was with GE. No, with General Motors. The country goes the way General Motors goes. Mm -hmm. But GE was one of those companies under, uh, what was the name, Immolt, whatever. You just thought they would do forever good. So I bought a GE. And then the following year, they dropped, what, like 80%. A lot. Yes. Like it went from 30s to like single digits. And I'm like, this is stupid. I'm never buying stock again. Ask about Kodak. Right? That's another one, yeah. (laughs) S&P 500 Um, stock that is no more. (laughs) No more, right. But I think part of it is we're not taught either that managing money is a long-term thing, right? It's, yes, you have to manage your monthly budget. Yes, you have to make sure that you can make ends meet. But really, you have to take a long-term approach. You have to manage. It's more important when managing money to manage your emotion than it is to manage the money. Because that is the problem. We're dealing with it right now in the current economic climate, what's going on and where things are headed. And... You know, it could get worse before it gets better, but it's still mm-hmm. got to be. What are you? What are you actually measuring? Are you measuring long term? or Are you measuring short? Right. Are you measuring the next three months? Or are you measuring the next three years? And it's and it's also the once again back to compounding interest, right? Like, I always thought that if you wanted to get into the stock market, if you wanted to do any of this stuff, you needed like thousands of dollars to get started. And I was under that misconception for years. Mm-hmm. My very first deposit into my stock account was $25, mm-hmm. right? And it was $25 two weeks later because I had it. And then it was $25 for probably the first six months. And I would have to do three deposits before I could buy a single stock. And I would buy one, mm-hmm. right? And then all of a sudden, that money slowly started working for me. Now that stock happened to go up. I was able to sell that and I bought two of a different one, right? But it was just 
that that thing where like oh i need to put thousands of dollars in to get started no no start start with whatever you have well and that's why i say emotion so important because managing assets too is is a triple edged sword because it's actually one you're managing yourself and your own risk mm -hmm. two you have to manage the tax liability um, I, I always joke and, and say you can't let the uh, tax tail wag the dog because <laughs> it, too many times decisions are made based on taxes. Right. Um, 1031 exchanges for real estate, you know, kicking the can down the road is, is really big. But where are taxes today in comparison to even where they're going to be in three years? It, right. You know, sometimes you have to. You're pay better the paper off paying it now than you later. You got to do it. Right? And if you don't sell your stock and it loses 50% in value because you were worried about the tax treatment. Mm hmm. Guess what? You just cost yourself way more than any tax did. Right. So that is one of the issues. And then, and then lastly, when you're investing too, that emotion of timing becomes so overwhelming. Um, and that is probably the biggest issue I see is that we're still always scared that we know what's around the bend. This time is different than the last time. This one's going to work out better than that one did. Um, and that's where the job of an advisor is more a psychiatrist than it is even a, <laughs> a financial advisor at times. I say that all the time because too many times am I there reminding, you know, remember we had this conversation in 2020. Remember, you know, 2008, everybody was looking for guarantees in 2009. It didn't matter what the stock market did. Correct. It's just every time there's a change and a tweak, we have to remember that. So advisors are going to be your friend and your ally and and you need to be talking to them about everything with a dollar sign attached that includes college that includes your mortgage that includes buying a car do i borrow the money do i take it out of my investment account do i get it from the dealership do i get it from the bank there are choices and it's just about finding the right one but give yourself outs give yourself the flexibility to go get at assets, get at money in different treatments to manage right. both taxes and investments. And it was interesting because um, I don't remember how old I was when I read um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, mm -hmm. right? It's a big one, yeah. It's, it's yeah. It, I recommend that read to anyone. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're going to become an investor after reading it. But what that helps you understand is that there's a difference between owning something and it being an asset. That's the biggest key. right. Yep. <laughs> like as people go out and like, oh, I bought a car. Okay, okay that's that's not an asset, mm -hmm. right? Like the moment you bought it, it's worth less than what you paid. Equity, the, the... equity in a home, right? It's an asset, yes, but it's not when you you can't take the brick out of the side of the building and take Correct. it to the cashier <laughs> and say, give me a hundred dollars, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, like, f as far as um, and this is kind of a good way to wrap it up is. What are some tools or resources or books, someone that's just starting out, that is going through this awakening of, I really need to learn more about money, where would you tell that person to start? To start by utilizing the resources that you have in your own family with who do they work with. Get multiple recommendations from, from family members. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? Um, I still like to start there because you'll see that they, a lot of them will do the same thing or they will have multiple relationships. Okay. Um, as far as books and reads and other things, I think you just cannot go wrong with getting onto the Yahoo Finance, the, the online opportunities that are the daily understanding of what's going on mm -hmm. and just reading an article, sitting down, having one article a day, why are things working the way they're working? Because if you're not entrenched in it every day, like an advisor might be, you have to be seeing what's going on in the world and form your own opinion. Um, don't go to social media for it. Uh, that's <laughs> honestly right. my the one thing out there. I see so many times I see a social media post that I agree with, mm -hmm. and there's so many people that don't agree with it and vice versa. And part of the problem is, is that everybody is out there Come, able it, to get their own opinion. It comes it's, back to the there's good advice and then there's good advice for you. Yes. Right? And I'm I'm not a particular fan of the the advisors who tell everybody that talk to the masses right. out there. I don't feel that they're, they're they have so some we're talking great, like Susie Orman type stuff. Yes, I wasn't <laughs> okay. going to bring up those names, I, I, but I, I, 
It's not the first time. <laughs> personally, the, the reason I don't agree is because they are talking to the masses and they have some great strategies, but it's not a one size fits it's all. Like a, it's like a baseline Take strategy, it for the baseline. Right? Yes. Take it for the pay down debt, good debt versus bad debt. You got to save, understanding how a Roth works, understanding how a traditional IRA works, but don't take it as Susie's talking to me. Right. That Susie knows my whole financial plan and she knows what I need. <laughs> right. Because that's not what they are. And then utilize those resources. And then from the family perspective, think about the people that are around you every day and get their opinions on what they've done and have an open mind. Don't look at it from the financial books. And I learned this from my grandpa and that's how it's supposed to be done. Listen and educate yourself on all the different tools that are out there because just to reiterate one of my biggest points that I have on financial planning, the tools that I recommended to clients 14 years ago are not the tools that I'm <laughs> utilizing today. Right. And just because they have a bad reputation on certain things is because they're just misunderstood. Each thing has a role and diversification, that word means a lot to a lot of people and different things to different people, but diversification is important to have multiple buckets, multiple tools in your arsenal so you can use them when they're right and use them when they're best fit and then not use them when there's something better out there. Home equity line of credit is a great example of what I mean. <laughs> have it open, have it available to right. you in an emergency, but don't use it. Right. It's just a tool. And when the tool is there and you need it and you're in a bind, utilize the tool. But you have to keep yourself there and, and bring in that full circle. You have to make sure that you manage yourself first and foremost. So is there anything out there like a basic school for managing your finances like a basic course that <laughs> explains some, like because we're a lot of times we're talking base concepts that people don't understand right yeah. like they the like i, I like rich dad poor dad mm -hmm. it he is really explaining some basic concepts um are there any other resources like that that the resources that are available i think are a little too complex for this conversation. Okay. So there's <laughs> there's no there's really no beginner's guide to managing your money. The, yeah, that that type of stuff happens just on education from you know, Rich Dad Poor Dad is a perfect example of that. It's just basic understanding, yeah. basic basic finance 101. Yes. That's what you need to know, pay down debt, those types of things. When you get into the more complex things, yes, there are tools out there and available, but that is where the relationship of the advisor should come into play. And you need somebody to talk to and put as a sounding board. It's okay to ask questions. And it, and it really sounds like it doesn't matter where you are, you should start developing a relationship with someone that has Somewhere access along to the, the way. tools. Yes. Right? Like whether you're $100,000 in debt or you have $100,000 sitting in the bank account, you really should start having a relationship with someone you can at least talk to. My belief is that these books and things are all on the same, and they're all opinion-based. Mm -hmm. And so that is why you build a relationship with an advisor in those situations that fits your mindset and your goals. The number one place I see that most people get their information will surprise you is probably their CPA. CPA is most of our clients come from CPA relationships okay. and they feel most comfortable getting their advice from their CPA because they feel like the CPA knows all about them already. Right. And that's why they feel comfortable with but, that relationship. But a CPA isn't necessarily a money manager per se. No, more and more are becoming and getting involved and getting right. licensed. And you're correct. They're not necessarily a money manager, but they usually will have those relationships. And Finance 101 says save money, put money aside, mm -hmm. show that you can just put that money away on a monthly basis, then you're ready to have those conversations with a financial advisor. I'm able to save, I'm able to put money away, now what do I do with it? Right. That's where they come into play. Okay, well, awesome. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. And uh, we will be back.